Wagner's music also triumphs harmonically. Harmonically. Whilst Germanic music for centuries worked on a dissonance to consonance basis, meaning we go from this to this, Wagner's dissonances resolve onto more dissonances, and they kind of they keep going and going and going and going. So how does he do this? He does this by pushing cadences to the very limit of diatonic harmony, meaning kind of major, minor keys. So let's take a cadence. Two, five. We make this a bit fancier. Two B to five, seven. Make this even fancier. Two half diminished B to five, seven, D. He then takes this five, seven, D and instead of resolving it onto either one or kind of six interrupted cadence, he resolves his 5, 7, D onto two half diminished B in the key, a tone below the one he was just in. And then that just keeps going round and round and round and round for several hours straight. And then we're back to which is where we started up here so notice how the outer lines are moving down in whole tone scales we've got and the inner lines are moving down in chromatic scales so. So these are not diatonic keys. Chromatic and whole tone scales are certainly not existent in the major minor system. However, Wagner has made them fit. I think it's less kind of he chose whole tone and chromatic scales and kind of forced them into major minor keys and more he was pushing major minor keys to the point of like, it's so tense at this point, it's only just in major minor keys that he's that what's coming out are chromatic and whole tone scales. Later in his life in 1872, Wagner moved to Bayreuth. It was here that he created a pilgrimage site for his own music. He kind of thought he was like the reincarnation of Jesus, that's somewhere in another one of his essays. Yeah. It was here that he designed his own concert hall and built it, especially for housing his operas, namely the ring cycle. One of the weirdest features of this was that all of the seating, the tiered seating, were all these really, really uncomfortable hard wooden benches and they were deliberately uncomfortable so that you wouldn't fall asleep. He also finally married Liszt's daughter Cosima after several years of kind of dating and having three children. Cosima was technically married to another man at this point which is why they didn't technically get married soon although they'd lived together for a long time. Wagner and Liszt have been good friends up until this point, however Liszt wasn't particularly happy that he was kind of dating his daughter. Anyway, that's Rheingold, Die Valkyrie, Siegfried and Gotterdemont were premiered and were actually very popular in the kind of nationalist audience that were going around and listening to these kind of things. The audience loved Germany and were happy that these new operas really celebrated German and <coughs> Nordic culture, along with folklore and music. It is no surprise having looked at Wagner's work, both his kind of slightly potty essays and his music in this great big manner, that he became a great inspiration to Adolf Hitler. As a young man, Hitler attended Wagner's operas and he went to Bayreuth to the pilgrimage site and he absolutely loved it. So much so that supposedly during the war, Hitler would take all of the Nazi troops to Bayreuth and make them sit on those really hard 
wooden seats to watch the operas and get really kind of um, patriotic towards Germany so they are kind of fired up before being sent out into battle. Wagner's anti-Semitic essays were spread far and wide. Whilst I'm certainly not saying that if Wagner had kept his mouth shut and his grumbly rants to himself that World War II wouldn't have happened, if Wagner didn't write those essays and kind of inspire Hitler in the way that he did, someone else would have. I am saying that maybe his music wouldn't be so problematic today if he didn't kind of make it known that he was quite so horrible. Even now, 140 years after Wagner's death, there are still countries in the world, such as Israel, who are mostly Jewish, who don't play his music because of who he was and what he said. The first time his music was publicly played there since World War II was by Daniel Barenboim, who played the orchestral overture from Wagner's <coughs> not opera Tristan and Isolde, which he wrote kind of in the middle of the ring cycle when he had a bit of a... not a mind poo. Artist's block with the ring cycle. The reaction from the audience here was mixed. Some were very happy that, you know, Wagner's music was being played here, others very angry. It's a difficult situation. Wagner was clearly a very nasty man to say the least, and his ideas went much further than just a personal grudge against Mendelssohn. Yet his music is some of the most beautiful and certainly the most influential going into the 20th century. 20th century music would not look like it does at all if Wagner had not existed or written his music. Should the personality of the creator determine what we think of their art? The 16th century composer Gesualdo actually murdered his wife. But do we think that when listening to this? Does this mean that we shouldn't listen to Gesualdo either because he was a murderer? He got away with murder, funny fact, because he was a prince of this kind of region in Italy so he didn't have to do anything, like any jail time or anything, but still. And Berlioz was a bit of a stalker, the list goes on. And there isn't really a right or wrong answer to this question. All I can say is that you need to listen to his music and decide for yourselves. Thanks for watching Musicianship 5, see you later.